this is gonna end your career. I'm either gonna do this or I'm gonna die. I'm nervous. Things are starting to take off for me. He said, Jay-Z wants to meet you. I play him cool to me. If I could write you a song to make you fall in love. And he just started going. Climbing the tallest mountain in the world. The altitude up high causes people to get boners. How much more thick did it get? It was real thick, dude. Can you, do you have any photos? <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get up at four every day. I had to walk 12 hours. My feet were killing me. If I could do that, what else can I do? I'm scared of the shit you do, dude. I'm so scared that you have my phone number now. <laughs> <laughs>
and she's a Detroit like hard rock. She tells the truth always. She's very loving, but she's but she doesn't bullshit. She called me that same day and she's like, "Yeah, I love your song, Cooler Than Me." I was like, I, and "She never told me that before." And then the same day, uh, my buddy Big Sean, who I was in his crew in Detroit, he hadn't blown. Neither of us had blown up yet. He called me. He was like, "Yo, Cooler Than Me's fire, bro." Hmm. So I'm like, wait a minute. Big Sean, my mom, and these sorority girls all like the same song. Like I might be, I might be on to something. So my my career started to like take off and on these college campuses and it would spread from campus to campus. And I'd play these little frat shows and I'd get there. It wouldn't be big shows, 50, 100 people, but they know the words to every song. I'm like this, you know, this is crazy. And um it was finals week, junior year. And I was at Duke and uh, things are starting to take off for me. I'm taking meetings with record labels and stuff. And, and then I'm back at Duke and I'm trying to like finish my papers and shit. And uh, my manager calls. He's like, yo, man, you got to go back to New York. I'm like, dude, I just came back from New York. Like I, what I have to do is finals week. Like I go to Duke, bro. It's just hard. He said, Jay-Z wants to meet you. I said, don't fuck with me. He said, I'm not. <laughs> I said, he said, I'm not fucking with you. I said, all right, well, I'm definitely going back to New York. <laughs> I'm definitely going back to New York. And um, I didn't I didn't think it would actually happen, you know, at the time. I was a college student and I thought, and you know, I knew the meeting, I, I knew a meeting would happen, but what I really thought was I would go up there and they'd say, you know, he got busy, you know, but we're gonna you meet with somebody else. So I didn't tell anybody, but I went up there and um, I played him my song Cooler Than Me. You know, I like took my little laptop out of the backpack and went behind his desk and looked for the aux cord and plugged in. I played him Cooler Than Me. If I could write you a song to make you fall in love, I would already. And he just started going. This. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a, it was a long, it was an amazing meeting, long meeting couple hours and um he said to john manili he's like well what do we do now and manili said i think we do a deal and i'm like trying to keep my poker face but i'm like doing backflips and my, you know my soul is doing backflips in, inside my body and i went back to duke the next day and i'm writing a, my sociology paper in the library and i i checked my email and i had a had an offer for record deal from from jay-z and i fucked up that that paper because i was distracted but yeah man that's what happened well what happened after that did you yeah i didn't sign with jay-z yeah, yeah. i signed with somebody else yeah. um why it feels like that could have been a i didn't sign um you gotta go back to time i'm in the crew of big sean yeah big sean signed to kanye but he hasn't taken off yet mm. he's been signed a few years so i was a little hesitant just based on what I knew um, of of signing to another artist, based just on just on Sean, nothing about Jay. And then also Rock Nation hadn't really started yet. They had signed J. Cole, um, but I I was bigger than J. Cole at the time. He hadn't he hadn't really uh, you know exploded yet. And so for those two reasons, and the the offer I got for that deal was was significantly better. Mm. So um, that's why I chose to make that decision. Did he give you any advice during that conversation? Like two hours is a long time. Like, and I'm sure there's other things to talk about besides the deal. I just remember his ear was really nuanced. He knew who my inspirations were by listening to my music. Oh, wow. So I felt very seen. You know, he could tell who I was listening to by listening to my stuff. And, you know, the way I, I molded it and melded it all together. And... Um, so from an art, from an artist perspective, he felt very understood, mm -hmm. and he he knew like my favorite album at the time was the Love Below by Andre Three Thousand, and he listened like I played him four songs, and he said, you know, I think you have the unprompted, I think you have the opportunity to make something like on the level of the Love Below. I was like, how do you know that? You know, but I remember, remember after he said, but it's something something you have to work for you have to stumble upon it and that's really true you know 
I think I already knew that intuitively as an artist, but yeah, you you know, it often doesn't come like right when you sit down, you, you work on it and you and it and you stumble upon something beautiful when you when you're making art. Yeah. It's interesting. But what's that like for you? For what? Like when Videos? you're coming up with your ideas. I don't know. I just do shit and things happen, really. I don't even have but do you go out with the intention like yo i'm gonna do this and then Sometimes, it turns like, out yeah like like yesterday wh- <laughs> like yesterday was just like i have a very basic idea it's like we're gonna rent cops and fake and arrest my friend but he's gonna think it's real uh-huh. but we don't know how we're gonna do it yet so we just kind of wing it i'm so scared that you have my phone number now <laughs> like, no nah, i'm it. just waiting for some insane fucked yeah. up prank to happen to me i mean no like <laughs> I, I, we were looking at earlier like when i first messaged you was i think october 2020 we looked it up i yeah. was so i didn't even know who you were obviously i had heard your music <sighs> this is t- 2020 i think everyone has obviously heard your music but i was doing hitchhiking across the country so I you would were just, hitchhiking across yeah so i i did wow. a video like a two-part video where i just hitchhiked across the country but it wasn't like did you make it all the way across i did but it wasn't like full hitchhike it was like you know probably like 60% of it kind of was my fans like scavenger hunt finding us giving us rides but we didn't yeah. cheat at all we walked the whole way or or got rides we couldn't ask anyone for a ride but they had to like kind of but then like probably like you know 30 40 percent of it was random people too like completely random mm. so I did it like that but then when I was doing that uh, my filmer told me about you he's like yeah this guy Mike Posner well walked across the country and I was like no way I was like fucking sick because I want to do shit like that um I grew up playing sports, but I want to do shit like that. But I post every week, so I can't like like I had it. So I hit you up, and I was like, "Would you want a uh, tandem bike across the country? I think that'd be funny. Like two people, you know, the two seater bikes, just just mobbing across the country. But it's gonna take like three to four weeks, you know. And I can't take like what I say. You you just said I said what's up, man. You're like what's up. I was like I want a tandem bike across the country. You're like nope. <laughs> <laughs> we should show we should show the messages. No, you're cool. You were like always replied. And like I hear you up many times. I had a few oh, ideas. like no, I, none, none, yeah. no part of me wants to do that, bro. Yeah, you were like, you're like still I, to this day. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> you were like, I like watching you do crazy stuff or whatever, but uh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and then, uh, but I was like, you know, one day it'd be cool to like do something together. And then I started this, so I was like, we should get them on. Yeah, man. But, and then maybe now we could, we should figure out something to do. I don't know. We're not tandem biking. Not that we can, we can find something else. But I don't know. I, I like that. You, I'm scared of the shit you do, dude. None of it's scary though. Not, to I, you, nothing really. I don't. I don't really. What I watched you those, the week after you got injured, man. But that, that was video. That was, those videos where you're like where it's like uh, where you comp up all the shit together. Oh, the mat, like the little like edits. Yeah, yeah bro, that, that shit's fucking insane. It seems dude. more insane probably because the music. Yeah, I mean, you throw a walk a flock on anything, it seems hard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what happened though? I wanted to get into the the walking across the country. How did that the whole thing even happen? That happened be you know out of a lot of pain. Yeah. I was uh, 30 years old. Um, I had achieved a lot of success. I had avoided relationships or pretty much commitments of any kind that didn't have to do it myself. And my father died. Um, My buddy Avicii died. And Mac Miller died. And then my buddy Ronnie died. And I just realized, I, like, I, I'm going to die too. And every, everybody wants me to forget I'm going to die. Everybody wants you to forget you're going to die because if you forget you're going to die, you'll waste your life doing what they want you to do. Yeah. You know, working for their company or buying the shit they're selling. And the things that used to excite me like having sex with strangers or doing interviews about myself or um walking on stage to hear people scream my name you know they they used to excite me now they exhausted me and i was just looking in the mirror not far from here i was living in this little guest house in west hollywood and i was like you know this this like this can't be it man like this, this can't be my life like it's got to be more like I have all this shit that I'm supposed to have. And I've worked so hard the last 10 years. I have all this money. And why doesn't it feel right? And what I realized was part of the reason, probably the main reason it didn't feel right, was there's nothing in my future that excited me. 
And I believe my experience has taught me that when the future is empty, the present is unbearable. And so I had had this dream of walking across America. I had that dream for like five years. Way before I felt all this pain, I had this dream. But I always would put it off. And strategically, you got to start like in spring. And I always say next year, next year, next year, next year. I got an album. I'll do it next year. I got a tour for the album. I'll do it next year. I got a wedding that I, I don't really want to go to, but I have to go to next year, next year, next year. And I just realized, like, dude, there's no fucking next year. Like, th this, this is my life. I'm either going to do this this year or I'm going to die. I'm not going to die the way my dad and Avicii and Mac and Ronnie died. I'm going to die a much sadder death. You know, the death where you're walking around talking to people, smiling, but you're dead inside. And you're living, you're, you're living the life you're quote, quote, supposed to live, you know, not, not your actual life. And so it was like, it was a real crossroads for me to do this. And it wasn't like just some funny thing. It wasn't like some bucket list thing. Yippee. Like, no, this was my life. Like I was going to do this or, or my life was like fucked. And it was freedom. It was me taking my life back. It was me saying I, freedom from who I always made myself be. Freedom from all the expectations I allowed myself to live under. And, and it wasn't easy, dude. People, you know, the people I worked with in the music industry, are like, dude, this is this is a career ender. This is this is going to end your career. You can't do this. You can't just leave. you can't just stop. You can't get off the ride. Yeah. Get off the ride, you can't come back on. That's how I feel too right now, not to interrupt, but like, I feel like you kind of like, I, I look at it two ways like that, but then sometimes I'm just like, I look at it in a positive way. It's like, I have this good opportunity, so don't fuck it up, you know? Mm. But then there's times where it's like, what you're saying I feel too. Yeah. So here's what I'll say, you know, there's nothing wrong with the ride, right? The ride might be, might be your journey or not. But for me, it was very clear that my life with a capital L, or I believe in God, mm -hmm. and I sort of used those words interchangeably, life and God, was asking me to go this way. And the expectations everyone had for me were asking me to go this way. And it was either I was going to have the balls to have faith and listen or not. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Enjoy fantasy sports? Visit Prize Picks, a unique daily fantasy app where you pick individual players based on set projections. Rather than choosing teams, you decide if a player will exceed or fall short of their projection. If you're knowledgeable about sports, give the Prize Picks app a try. It's accessible in 70% of the United States, including California, Florida, and Texas, and Arizona. First time users can benefit from 100% deposit bonus by using the code DANNY. Enter the code DEPOSIT100 and they'll match it with an additional 100 by using the code DANNY. I don't have a judgment about the music industry. I don't think it's evil. I don't, none of those things. And if somebody's going on tour and making albums like a machine, like, and they're happy doing it, it's amazing. Human beings are like flowers. You know, we're all beautiful. But when you put us together in a bouquet, bouquet even more beautiful. I thought you were going to say they all, we all die. Yeah. <laughs> That's also true. You know, <laughs> it's also true. <laughs> so, I mean, this is really what I learned. Um, there's no, like, it's your life. It's your life, Danny. You know, so there's no rules to this shit. You know, there's, there's ways people do certain things that may optimize, you know, like drop a video a week and that may optimize for X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, you're, you're only on one, you're the only one that's got to live your life. Stefan you know? over here, he's sweating. He's like, dude, <laughs> Stefan's like, shut the fuck up, man. We got to make this money. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you do got to make the money, right? You got to do So I'm not trying to argue out of that, shut the but fuck. there's a way. <laughs> Cut. You know, there's a way, there's a way. I want you to make the money. I do. 
I want to make money Should too. too yeah. I want you to make the money and have the juice at the same I time. No, I need to, I do want to put, I just got hurt though. So I just started walking like three or four days ago. Right. But I'm trying to do something crazy. Like I seen, remember we were talking to you when you went to Everest. I just hate the fucking cold. So I don't, I have no desire to ever do that, to be honest. I didn't invite you. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I know you wanted me there though. I could tell. The <laughs> there's a couple lonely tell. nights. He was like, there's a couple lonely. I actually do. Alone in the world. <laughs> no, like, it's uh, just me and videos of Denny. <laughs> hey, you know, Mount Everest, uh, the altitude up high causes people to get boners. Yes. I wasn't, wanted to ask you. That was my next question. They call it altitude thickness. So how, how much more thick did it get? He's real thick, dude. Can you, do you have any photos? <laughs> and then a, a dick pic up in Everest? <laughs> no, how long did that? Yeah, that it's whole all, thing take? all my first dates are there now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling you, trust me, once we go to this place, it's way bigger. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't is normal. We gotta, go, we gotta go somewhere else. I can't do this. Oh. No, how long did that take? Thicker, go? not longer, just thicker. <laughs> so, um, Wait, what? What's your question? How long Everest. did the boners last? No, nah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, did, did Everest you last longer when you're up there? I wasn't fucking up there. <laughs> did you did you jerk off at all when you were in a, doing the base the Everest camp? Climb? I did. Yeah, base camp. I did not once, not on the actual climb. Yeah, There's, you don't have enough. But base energy. camp, you did. Uh, how many? Just one. Time? You got your own tent in base camp. Yeah, that's nice. No, probably way more. A couple. I mean, I was there so long, dude, waiting for uh, waiting for the weather. Right there, like two months. So you were, you, the whole your whole Everest trip was how long? Door to door, two months. Two months. Yeah. But how much of that was at base camp? No, no. How much Most of that was of it. spent jerking off? Let's get to the point. Okay, let's no, we'll we'll put kidding. a little pie chart up. It's like time at base camp. <laughs> time jerking 60%. off. Sixty <laughs> percent time at base camp jerking off. Eighty-five percent. No. <laughs> no. Um. I stopped jerking off uh, like, um, gosh, uh, August. It's like after February after now? Yeah, this year. You spent it all on Everest. <laughs> yeah. like, no more. <laughs> it's all gone. <laughs> With my seed. <laughs> I swear I was still No, there, man. I did a semen retention. Did it work? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by that? Like, did I, did I complete it? No, what does that mean? Semen? Like, I've I didn't people- jerk off or have sex for like, Four four months, I think. I feel like my head would explode, man. I don't know. It was awesome. Really? Yeah, I loved it. What what, what did you like about it? I started because I, I had a breakup and I had a lot of pain come up. Like grief. You know, when you have a breakup, when you have a relationship and it's grief. Because the, the relationship ends, you have to grieve that. We also have to grieve your dreams. You know, your vision of what you thought it could be. You have to grieve that. And what I noticed, I have all this, you know, uns unresolved grief from other shit you know that that i never let myself feel all this shit started coming up so i was like man i got this pain dude i gotta i gotta feel the pain because it's showing me where i need to grow pain shows you where you need to grow so i felt myself just wanting to numb it dude, like, i thought you were gonna say i felt myself off. wanting a nut <laughs> yeah dude i did i wanted to nut the pain away that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to pull up the porn. I wanted to, uh, and I wanted to call strangers to fuck me. And um, I knew that was just going to distract me from how I needed to grow. So that's why I did the retention, bro. It was great. How long was that? I did from, I did from August to January 1st. And then January I met, <laughs> Yeah. I was like, come, Bluey. <laughs> Welcome to Mike Poster New Year's party. Dun, 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 dun. They got Vici playing. Dun, 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 dun. Have you seen 40 Year Virgin? Yeah. You know when he jerks off for the first time, he like lights all the candles and shit? <laughs> I don't remember <laughs> it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. That shit's I met him. I fell in love in that time, though, also. What time? Which is great. Oh, during, during that. During the, during the retention. Yeah. Damn. You're you're in a relationship right now. Yeah. How was it? Amazing. Hell yeah. Fucking incredible. The ever stuff. Yeah. It took yeah. two months. What, what, what? How did that even start? <laughs> I did the ever. <laughs> we we, all we talked about was jerking no. off. <laughs> I'm glad we. Did. I want to know about Everest. <laughs> all right. Not just the jerk off. Okay. Off. Everest was crazy, right? So let me tell you about Everest. I'm gonna put these on because it's getting yeah. dark. Like I want to know why, why you I even wanted to do it, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. So when I finished walking across America, we talked about why I walked yeah. across America, but. It took me six months and three days. It changed my life. And what I mean when what I mean when I say it changed my life, what I mean by it changed my life is 
as I walked, in order to complete the project, I had to uncover parts of myself I didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. And that's like really what I'm talking about is like the journey itself, in order to complete it, it was so hard that the version of me that started, the little like skinny Jewish kid that made music in the studio, couldn't get it. He had to die in order for the journey to be completed. So, you know, I walked across New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, Arizona, Navajo Nation, Nevada, California. And after six months and three days, almost lost my foot to a rattlesnake bite. Um, I dove in the Pacific Ocean. When I was in that water, I thought that I would feel accomplished. Right? It makes mm -hmm. sense. You did this big thing. You thought you'd feel calm. But surprisingly, the emotion that those waves in the Pacific Ocean washed over me wasn't accomplishment. It was possibility. It was, wow, if I could do that, what else can I do? And there were a lot of parts that I uncovered of myself on the journey, but probably the most notable part is a part of my being that I, I call snake bite. Mm -hmm. Snake bite, you got a snake bite for sure. Is it's just that like dog motherfucker that will never give up. Like snake the determined bite. ass motherfucker. Like most of your friends and family never even met that part of you. Yeah. But it's there. It lives in a cage. He eats raw meat, you know? <laughs> and like, for me, I didn't really know I had that before. I'm like, smiley, nice guy. But like, I found that yeah. on the journey. I was so scared of uh, losing snake bite. Like, I didn't want him to go back to the cage no, forever. I, I think I know what you mean. So, and and the walk, like, it was so hard and it hurt so much that I could pretty much access him whenever I wanted, you know, because I had to get up at four every day. I had to walk 12 hours. My feet were fucking killing me. Like, my body was hard to stand up. I'm like, I'm going to walk 30 miles anyways. So the snake bite was coming out like all the time. But I was scared of moving back to West Hollywood and and forgetting about him. Mm -hmm. So the fear of losing snake bite combined with the, the feeling of possibility caused me to first dream about Mount Everest. And then the dream started to become a plan. And I think dreams are either growing into plans or they're withering into regret, period. Mm -hmm. So that dream started to, to grow into a plan. And I didn't unpack my bags. People asked me like, you know, what was it? I didn't, I didn't go home. I didn't have a home to go back to. Like I, I, two weeks later, I climbed Mount Hood and I didn't know anything about climbing. I knew like for me to go from nothing, never holding the ice axe, never wearing crampons to climbing the tallest mountain in the world and belonging there. That was my goal. I wanted to belong there. I didn't want to just climb it. I wanted to belong there. To belong there, it's going to be nothing but fucking pain. And it's going to be the hardest thing. But I just looked at what I just done and I said, well, that's what I do now. I do hard things. So the next year and a half, I climbed 71 mountains with my coach, Dr. John. And uh, we went to Nepal in uh, 2021, in the spring season, and, and tried to climb our 72nd. And that was, that was Mount Everest. Why, why do you think you didn't discover that while you were touring and as an artist? Because what you did before easy. was hard. It's harder. the opposite. It's really? The, why? Because it's I everyone's mean, to make it in the industry is not easy for most people. Like why? It's easy in a different way. I mean, it's difficult in a different way. But when you're on tour, it's it's very toxic in a lot of ways because everyone around you works for you, bro. When I'm on tour, I don't carry my own bag. Like I don't cook my own meal. I don't do shit. And I live on a tour bus. And normally, like, you might be the boss of a business, but you go home at night to, like, your family. But on tour, you you live on the tour bus with 
your employees. And even though they're all good people, there's still this dynamic of everyone works for you. And I just noticed like every t- every time I go on tour, like <laughs> start, I feel like I start becoming like kind of a diva, like a little <laughs> bitch, you know? And so I, you know, my life, I had, sp- I've basically spent a decade trying to make it more and more comfortable. And I thought, you know, if I get it just right, maybe if I move to this part of LA and I date this girl and I have one more hit song and I maybe, maybe, you know, trade in this car for this car. And and if I just arrange, he's just like, I could just move, re- rearranging the furniture in the room of my life. Maybe I just move them around, then I'll, it'll all click finally. And it was all about making it more comfortable, more like, like, let's put a nicer couch in this room moving the furniture out of my room until i realized like i'm never gonna be happy i need to do the opposite i need to leave this fucking room and leave this fucking house i need to go outside and live in a tent i need to do the i make it less comfortable and that's where i found all the juice that's where i found the juice and then you come back you have comfortable shit you enjoy it you know but yeah man it 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 was hard in different ways, but yeah, tour tour is a different thing. <laughs> I always tour. feel like it's like chasing a mist almost is what I would always like describe it. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I think about when I was like, like 2016, right. It was like, I was just insane. And I think you get older, you kind of get maybe a little more mature, a little lazier, which I feel is natural, but sometimes I gotta like, you know, push myself a bit but i'm definitely like way i'm like a bitch compared to 2016 i would have done almost anything then so there's a lot of times where i'm like that's why i want to like go do some crazy shit i just want to like i have an idea i want to do soon uh but i I feel like it needs like more of a like i need to like help in some way but i want to be homeless for seven days Mm -hmm. and then but it just seems kind of like fucked up like oh he wants like there's no like so i want to like maybe i figure out what my expenses are for seven days and donate that money or whatever it is right Mm -hmm. Where like I, I'm homeless for seven days, but I can't do anything or, or whatever it is, you know, but I want to, I want it to have some sort of good to it too. Not just me fucking profiting off homeless people. Why do you want to do that? Just like be uncomfortable, you know, like, just like kind of put me back to how it was in like 2016. Like just when you got nothing and like, you got to figure out what to do. Like when I first came here, yeah. I remember I had like a Ziploc bag. I had like $32, like yeah. cash. My bank account was like minus a hundred. So you couldn't even use the card. Just like being in that thing where yeah. it's like, there is no, like, I can't just just go swipe that bitch on anything I need, you know? So I, I just like, I want to be like in that environment a little bit at times, you know? I think that's beautiful. Yeah. The Seneca, you know, Seneca, mm. Stoic philosopher, he, he he would practice that exact thing. I think a day, a month or something yeah. like that. Um, where he, he, and he was wealthy. He's one of the first like investors or successful investors. And, and he would practice poverty a day, a month, I think. Um, I think about that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't think I it's th- as bad because I come from nothing. So it's like, I feel like the kids kind of know that at least. So it's not like I'm like, you know, like, I don't know. It's just going back to your roots. You have almost. it built in. Yeah. I, feel I don't like think it's, it's bad at your- all. I think you're doing it from a beautiful place. You're not trying to make fun of people. Yeah. You're trying to, um, what I'm hearing is you're trying to reinstill some grit and gratitude. Definitely. Definitely. For when you come back to everything else that you've earned, by the way, you appreciate it more. That's one thing too. I feel bad is like kids. Cause like if a kid sits here and doesn't believe me, right. When they're like, well, uh, you know, some people, some people genuinely think like once you're rich, you're ha- you cannot be happy mm-hmm. or you cannot be sad. You're only happy if you're rich. Like they, there's people out there that genuinely think that. So it's like, I've been at the bottom, you know, and I've been, you know, I've had millions of dollars. So it's like, I try to tell people that there's some people that just don't believe it too, which is crazy. But yeah. They got to learn for themselves. Yeah. And like, you know, it's like, I was one of those people. Yeah. 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 Like, so I, I just like to try to tell them that too, but I feel like some of my better, like more happier moments are almost when I had nothing too, you know, mm. I definitely like when you're talking about walking across the the country and when you jump in the water, it's like, I almost feel like I didn't do that. But like, I almost feel like it's like the journey of that is what's like the happier part. Not so much the jumping into the water. Yeah. It's like, it's what it seems like. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I believe that once, once a past accomplishment is in the past, that's what we're really talking about. There's only really two things you can do with it. You can a, Use it as an excuse to not do anything else. Right? Like, I walked across America one day. I'm the man now. Da, da, da. That's that's actually, I think, desecrating what you did. Because you're using it as an excuse to not 
be who you f- be your true self now. Yeah. Or you could be used as fuel. A reminder of bro, like I fucking did that. Well, I can definitely do this. I think as as we evolve and grow as humans, our priorities change. I, I I mean, I know mine have drastically over the last I summoned Everest um June first, twenty twenty one. So almost, what's that going to be, three years in June? Mm -hmm. So two and a half years. I mean, dude, my life's completely different now. My priorities have changed. Some of my goals that that I remember, like when I got out of, off the mountain, I knew that it's just similar to yourself. My whole life, my, my whole 20s, which seemed to last, have lasted in my 30s a little bit. <laughs> um, I put all my energy into work. And I was at a place where I wanted a relationship, but I was I was like stunted in that area. I didn't put no time into it, no effort into like a few girlfriends here and there. And, and so I was like, hey man, like climbing that is actually scarier than Everest to me. It was scarier to me than going back. So all I'm trying to say is that as time evolves, I think it's healthy and appropriate that your goals might change. But the element of finding the edge is the same. Mm -hmm. It might be an emotional edge now. It might be learning this skill in a different area of life. And I just think like we can have it all. I really do. I kind of do. You know, (laughs) like I think we can have like beautiful family lives like amazing marriages tons of money um serve like have fulfillment make a difference in the world create beautiful pieces of art um challenge ourselves physically like be outside be super healthy give back have fun i believe i think we can have it all and i think like yeah man it's it evolves you know it evolves and I think like I, I would meet people in the mountains that would get stuck. They're like when I finish this mountain, I'm going to go to this next mountain. And then I'm going to go to that one. And they all had to be more and more and more dangerous. And I met, I met people that like definitely are dead now because they're just stuck, like doing the same trick. And, you know, what happens is if you're really good in one area of life, and we all are, like there's one area of life where you kill it. Well, then you tend to focus only on that area. Why? Because you get a lot of positive feedback when you're working in that area because you're good at it, right? And you used to spend all this time there. And even deeper than that, you start to create a a theory about life where you start to say, the most important thing in life is this thing that I happen to be really good at, right? We all do that. And so that's a trap, not to anyone else, it's a trap to you. And you start to realize, hey, I can be good at all parts of life i just gotta put energy into all of them and it's never gonna be balanced perfectly i'm gonna work really hard in this one then me i focus on that one or maybe it's these two or it's always evolving and changing but we just want to like we just want to always become the 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 most beautiful version of ourselves i think and that's that's how you do it what about pooping in Everest? How was that? <laughs> oh, that's cool, man. Come so on, man. that we, shit just frees up right away. When you're on Everest, you have um <laughs> you have uh you have a choice as you get high on the mountain to wear either uh, a one piece suit. It's called an eight thousand meter suit. Mm. So it's a suit you wear above eight thousand meters. It's like a wearing a sleeping bag. It's like fucking hot, dude. Yeah. If you were wearing it now, we'd be sweating our asses off. You wear a one piece suit. Which is hotter or a two-piece suit. I chose a one-piece suit. And like a little kid with the pajamas, it's got a zipper on the ass. You just <laughs> unflap it. And that's how you take shits. And you know, also like where you, where you do it, like a bucket? No, like at each camp, there'll be a um there'll be like a little like area. Yeah. They'll they'll, they'll set up like a tent over it. And basically, it'd be like <laughs> you're like shitting on a glacier, hmm. and it fucking smells bad. Dude. Oh, that it smells bad. In base camp, it's in it actually in big buckets because it's like a national park, so you can't leave you can't leave anything there. They keep it clean. 
so that the shit all gets like put onto um, oxens and they take oh, it out. I think my friend said, "Is is there things? Uh, is there numbers to them? Like base camp two or three? Or yeah, something. yeah. So base he camp. Said, he, he just my friend Neil Hirschman got to shut him out. He he just did Everest too, uh, maybe like a year or two ago. But he told me to ask you about base camp two and four. He said that they, everyone has like a funny like story at those that those those spots for some reason. Oh man, yeah, I got I got crazy stories from both of them. So. <laughs> Base camp is it? Yeah, it's base camp. You got base camp. It's about fifteen thousand feet. Then you got camp one. Then there's camp two. Yeah, yeah, okay. You go up to low T face. Uh, there's camp three, and then camp four is in the saddle, and then there's a summit. And mind you, you can't just go up mm -hmm. because it's so high. If you just go, up, you die. So you have to go up, yeah, a little bit and come down. Let your body build red blood cells, and you go up one more time further come down with your body build more red blood cells and then you can try to summit so it's this like whole process it's hard to explain the the altitude man like that was the last point i was gonna make about shitting is like me walking to the bathroom is very hard in mount everest it's unlike anything else you could really experience it's just like trying to live without air and they call it you know, above camp four, the, the death zone. And they call it that because your body is dying when you're there. A human body can't survive there. And so you're trying to climb this, the tallest mountain in the world while you're dying. That's the game. Mm. You're not, it's not like me and you now, well, you're hurt, but it's not like we're here where we feel good. You know, we had some food this morning and we're going to go out for a rip and do it. No, it's like, you're at, you're at 5%. You know, your your tank's at five percent, and and now you're gonna go try to do it. So, camp two, uh, I mean, that was like that was one of the worst moments of my life. I was in camp two and lay next to Doctor John, my coach, and I couldn't sleep there because every time my I closed my eyes and my res respiratory rate was slow, my body thought I was suffocating. So I I go like this, nod off, and then I. <gasps> That you wake up like this, no sleep. We were there like three, four days because of a big storm and this giant fucking avalanche, man. Um, our tent ripped open. Snow started to hit me in the face and all hell was just breaking loose. I was screaming, John, John, avalanche, avalanche. And I didn't think I was going to die. Like I knew I was dead mm. for sure. The avalanche at camp too, like that's it, you know. And I almost died with the snake bite, and that was like kind of peaceful. This wasn't peaceful. This was just fucking scary. It was just, it was just horrible. And uh, for whatever reason, the 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 avalanche stopped. And I look at my hands like you before an interview, man. They were like this. Yeah, man. Once yeah. I saw your face, I was just, Yeah. I know it's fucking beautiful, right? Yeah, it's nice. It's, I hit it's you the with voice. The, the voice gets hit me. Hit you with those bit. eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I'm Stop, saying? man. Stop. Mm -hmm. Do it again. <laughs> you do a little poetry. I could sing too. If I could write. No. Not again, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm nervous right now. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, uh, yeah, it just stopped. And basically what happened was the avalanche stopped just short of hitting our camp. And it it displaced all this. It pushes all this air. So it's like an air explosion that hit us. And we were okay. We were, But, you know, that air explosion could kill you too. So we were just lucky. And it didn't like it was time to go like two hours later. <laughs> you know, we just kept going. But I definitely had some, like, PTSD from that. Every time I heard a, like, rumble sound. I thought you were gonna say every time I heard the air conditioning kick on. <laughs> yeah, shit, not not like that. But when I heard when I came home and I heard thunder, I freaked the fuck out. Really? Okay. Yeah, I thought I was gonna die. And uh, again, yeah, any like big loud noises like that, fireworks and shit. It, yeah, anything like that. It lasts for like six eight, six seven months, and now now it doesn't bother me anymore. You don't want to come to Florida, man. Do 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm good. Now I can hear the loud noises. Now I don't think I'm at that. But yeah, I remember when I went home. I was like, "Yo, this is crazy." Um, camp four. Okay, so now if I throw them up there, dude, I shit you not, man. I was laying there. You only got a couple hours there, because you 
climb to camp four and then you got a few hours to rest and then you got to get ready you go to the summit i was laying there i closed my eyes and i just had a psychedelic trip i was seeing all this sacred geometry this lattice work rainbow technicolors and this peace just watched washed over me felt like yeah every day like my whole life is a year and a half like it was Everest, 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 dreaming about it, studying it, training for it, risking my life, climbing crazy shit. So when I get there, like it won't be as hard. And then you're there and everyone's talking, Everest, Everest, the weather, weather, Everest, 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 Everest. And I was there, I was just about to get to the final thing. And it was just this feeling of, you know, you're going to go do this, but it doesn't matter. You know, it matters, but it doesn't matter. And my friend Chad, God bless him. I asked him before I left, I said, record a record a message for me. And I'm not going to listen to it until the summit day. I can't for. So I listened to his message that he made for me. He's one of my best friends. And he said, he said, this won't be the most beautiful thing you do. But it's gonna be fucking awesome. And he said, "Go, go up there, enjoy it, and get back home to us. Love you." And so it was just that feeling, man. That would start at eight p.m. Went out, passed everybody. Felt like I was playing under the Friday night lights and <laughs> stars, and I was just strong, strong. Me and my team, we, we passed all the other teams. We were first ones on the summit. People talk about the lines on every line. There's no lines for us. We passed everybody. First ones up there and got up there. John's next to me. How long does that take, though? That, like, I guess that summit? From Camp 4 to um, Summit for me was eight hours. Hmm. But your day is less than half done. Yeah. And the summit is only halfway. You got to get down. Yeah. That's where it's dangerous too, right? It's coming down. More dangerous coming yeah. down because you're more tired. It's crazy. So, you know, some summit is optional. Coming down is mandatory. So we're up there and, um, you know, we timed it perfect because John's good at that and sun, watch the sunrise from the summit of Mount Everest. And, That's sick. You know, people don't realize mountains have shadows. Just looking over this into China, this giant pyramidal shadow, hundreds of miles long of Mount Everest. And it's a cloudy day down there. You know, we're just miles above the clouds. And it's the most beautiful moment of my life, you know? And I, I, I just wept, I wept. And I said, I remember I said to John, I said, this took everything, and it did. The thing that strikes me about summoning Everest and walking across America is you probably met a lot of strangers around the way, right? What was the most profound conversation you had with a stranger in either of those two experiences? I was in Arizona walking across the U.S. in the Wallapai Reservation. And I always walked into traffic because it was safer. Um, but a car came, but it was after the snake bite. So a car came from behind me as a red F-350 and pulled off to the right side of the road. So it was on the opposite side of the road from me. And I was a little scared. You know, it's like an F-350. I'm, I'm on a reservation. And I'm like, you know, if dude got F-350, probably, you know, hard-ass motherfucker, probably, you know. I don't know what, I know what to expect, dick. you know? know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this guy... Gets out of the car as a kid. You know, I'm 31 at the time. He's probably 23. And he and I'm scared, you know, because he's dipping and dodging across the highway to get to me. And he runs over. And we talked for a while and it was like small talk. But I could tell like there was more that was supposed to happen energetically. So I learned this question from Chaplain Kevin. He told me, you know, if, like if you want to break through small talk, just ask this question. So I asked him, I said, if I pray for you, what should I pray for? You asked him that. Yeah. I asked everybody that, mm -hmm. that I met on the walk. Mm -hmm. I may have forgot a few times, but I asked pretty much everybody that. He said to me, 
Mike, five years ago, my my dad died from drinking. And three years ago, my only brother, my my older brother, he died from drinking. Um, just three months ago, my, my mom died from drinking. So if you pray for me, pray for my sobriety, because I'm the only one left. And he turned around and he ran back across the highway, reached into the F-350, grabbed some out, came back across again, and he put a leather satchel in my hand. And he said, sweet grass and sage, this will protect you while you walk on our land. He drove away and he put his fist out the window like this. It was so easy for me to think like while I'm doing that journey, you know, we got audiences, right? Fans, people come up and I was going this mode of fan regulation, you know, like it's like a mode of my being like, take picture. Okay, good. I'm like now next picture, like go, move to you know, this shit, bro? Yeah. Or like you're just trying to get like, get out of it basically, yeah. like finish it. I thought, because of my past as an artist, I felt like everyone showing up wanted, like I was there to give them something, a piece of advice, a picture, like some inspiration. It's emotional just because, you know, so many people came up not to get something from me. They were there to give something to me. And he was definitely one of them. <laughs> Tearjerker. Yeah. Mike, what, uh, what's the lyric that people quote to you the most from your songs? Because I, I feel like if they come up to you and say something about it's not the popularity of the song, it's like the He's death. He's gonna of sing it. it again, dude. Here we go. <laughs> I I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Lyric people quote to me was I don't know. Or song that had an impact, like Yeah, up. a lot of it is the videos that I have about like I, I have songs where I make the music video the kind of story of these journeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um probably the ones that I hear the most is um move on. Move on, the, the music video is the story of, of why I'm choosing to walk. And then Live Before I Die is the story of the walk, that music video. And then Home, the song we talked about, yeah. is the story of Everest, that music video. Yeah. So those ones, I, I... And then there's one, there's other random fucking thing where I had this giant beard. I was playing this like fucked up acoustic show someplace. And... I was about to play Ibiza and I talked about death the same way we talked about death, about how people want you to forget you're going to die. So those four videos, like that video is so random, but people bring it up all the time. Like, um, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I saw this video and I did X. I met a guy yesterday, not yesterday, a couple of days ago, Steven Johns. Um, he's an NHL player. And he told me like he, he had concussions and he was really depressed and COVID and and he he shared with me that like he was he was like thinking about killing himself and he saw I think live before I die I want to say and he he was like dude I'm gonna rollerblade across America because you know he was a hockey player like skating so he he and he did it and and he was like bro it changed changed my life and he's like i'm still in pain because he had this pain from the head he goes i'm still in pain but i'm like happy and i have pain at the same time and so you know just, you hear stuff like that and you know it's, it's hard really to take it in honestly because you because you're out there doing it just because it's your you were inspired to do it. It felt like God wanted me to do it. Like I'm called that way. So I go that way and I'm scared to do it, but I'm doing it. But it really is like, it was a personal thing. And to see it touch other people. And, you know, I started my podcast. I talk a lot with the audience. Yeah, I yeah. bring them on live. I talk. Yeah. So I'm hearing stories of people. Yeah. Like talk to a guy the other day. I saw that thing and I started, I quit my job. I started this business. I'm like, it's crazy. I'm still, I'm still, and I'll never know. You never know the full rever reverberations of, yeah. you know, the people you touch. The legacy, your legacy, true legacy lives in the hearts of those that you touch. And you never know how big your legacy is. But 
still to this day, you know, I, I learn more about people that were inspired by it. And, you know, I, I just, I just want to share the stuff I learned. So I thank you for the opportunity to do that here today. And I want to learn more and, and share that as well. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask, though, you said like when you were going to do the walking thing that the, you're the, you're the music people were like, Oh, your career is done. Did you, did you feel like that impact after or did, did it? Cause I, I mean, even like on Spotify and stuff, like you have millions of mm. mon- monthly listeners and stuff. I got more popular. Yeah. Yeah. I got more popular. Like, like you heard about me <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> from that. That's why I asked. Cause like, you know, but I was prepared for it. I was prepared to not, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the interesting thing with the pot, I talk about this a lot, but you know, I got hurt in the middle. I got bit by a rattlesnake and it fucked me up. I was in the hospital five days and I was out three weeks and I went from walking 24 miles a day to I couldn't walk to the bathroom. And that's when I got really popular. Uh, you know, the, 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 the news, like the mainstream news picked up that story. And it was tough because my mind equated get, being hurt with getting attention, getting fame. And so there's a little bitch part of me that wanted to stay hurt. I see. Didn't want to get better because yeah. everyone's taking care of me. And, I'm, you know, people I look look up to are <laughs> DMing me, like, feel better. And I, I, all this, what I think is love is not love. It's attention and sympathy. It was a big difference between mm-hmm. attention, sympathy, and love. But I thought it was love. And, you know, the hardest part was getting better from that. Going, hey, actually, motherfucker, I'm healed. So you're gonna just like stay hurt because you want the you want the cuddly sympathy, or you can go back and and like uncover who you really are. And that was the thing, man. There was no other way. You know, there was no other way. There was no I, I try to explain this to people. It was like it wasn't no podcast. I could people go, what was your number one takeaway from the walk? They want me to tell them the lesson I got so they can get the lesson without going. Yeah. 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 It doesn't work like that. The The thing I got from the walk was snake bite, was par- parts of me that live inside me now that only only came from me getting really fucking hurt and then walking a thousand more miles and finding that in myself that is now me, that is a part of me now. I can't give that to you. I'm not saying everyone needs to go risk their life on a walk. I don't believe that at all. But I do believe everyone needs to find what their version of the walk is. That's the only way you're going to uncover I think yeah, that too for these, everything in life. Treasures. Like yeah. people want a shortcut to abs or a shortcut to get followers or a shortcut. Mm-hmm. It's like I mean, if you're getting shortcuts, it's not it's not legit. It's just a joke at that point. So it's not gonna work mm-hmm. for anything, I think. It's, what was the one video that made you famous? How do you sell so many <laughs> yeah. t shirts? It's like motherfucker, I do it every single day of my life. I yeah. give up everything to like Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what's the most annoying is that the most annoying question? I mean, yeah. I I, I I don't want to seem ungrateful. There's a lot of annoying shit. I think everybody deals with that. Normal people, famous people. You know, my most annoying one. Huh? Um, Cause I do like this other shit. People go, you still make music? <laughs> I'm like, bro, I make so much music, bro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if they only heard my last hit, cause I can't make a song be a hit. Yeah. I put out a lot of songs and then I've, I'm blessed. Like you blessed. I yeah. five, six hits. But you had five. I thought you only had like one or two. No, no, I'm just kidding. I had I'm two. No, I, <laughs> it's actually true. I had two, two that I sang, and then I've written for other people, like boyfriend. Yeah. That's what I heard. Like yeah, that was here from Room Five, and, and that was his first number one or something. Or is that not true? I don't know. I saw. Mm-hmm. I was looking up something that said like you wrote boyfriend for Justin Bieber, which was like his first number one on whatever thing it was. But I don't know. yeah, that's crazy. Number ones is such like. You That's can, why you never know. You can do, you like, there's all these different charts, right? Feels like so, New York Times bestseller type it's shit. It's such <laughs> bullshit. Like, because you have like the EDM dance chart of North America, and people yeah. will be like, I have 75 number one songs. You're like, like, you'll hear it all the time. Like, it's like, like the barbecue place, voted number one best barbecue place, yeah, Southwest like, Florida. They're like, yo, like, that guy has 560 number ones. I'm like, yeah. On what chart, bro? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Is his name John Lennon? <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. You know? But yeah, if they if the last if they're not like a like you said, like your core fans, if they're not my core fan, the last song they heard was I took a pill in Ibiza. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I've released albums since then, you know, but 
that's annoys me. I should probably try to evolve to a point where it doesn't even annoy me. Yeah, I try to. Some people say I, I, they think I'm ungrateful for this one. This one, this one's just annoying in my opinion. If someone comes up to me and they're like, "Are you Danny Duncan?" Mm. I just feel like if you're a legit fan, you know it's me. Or do you ever say yeah? And they're like, nah. Yeah, that too. Then I'm just like, bro, can we just fucking move on on our day and do something? You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to sit here like, and you're like, I just feel weird. I don't know. It's like an uncomfortable feeling for me. Like when someone's just like, oh my, or like if That's they're freaking good. out. They're like, oh my God, dude. Oh my, <laughs> what the fuck? They cry. I'm like, dude. I no, can't. you got to give the crier a hug. I man. do. I do. I try to always support. I'm just saying it makes me feel like uncomfortable. Kinda. I get that. It's like a weird, I get I'm that. like, do what I do right now. And then I try to just make, I try to make Cause you're kind of, of a weird guy. I am dude. I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're a very weird guy, but you're kind of an awkward guy. <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm fucked up. You know? Yeah. In the night. I like, I love you. Yeah. Thanks man. I needed that. But I would say like, you do you kind of like making the room a little awkward? Yeah. I like, I, I think it's funny. Yeah. 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 You I, I, like I just try to, I think anything though, like sad shit. So you want like I try to do make it like jokes. Right. Right. Just right. anything. Even if, even if I genuinely am sad. I, I have better one out of it. when when I used to have a big beard mm -hmm. people would ask, this this was an annoying question this was just like <laughs> sad people would ask this is I would get this all the time people would ask me what happened to you <laughs> yeah yeah. And it wasn't funny at the time. It's funny now, but I was like, "Can we get a picture of it?" It's when you when you came across me, I had a big ass beard. Really, on you've the seen walk. these photos, Danny? And um, how do you respond to that, Mike? I don't have my phone. Around. Then with yeah. like depression and sadness, why did you have the big beard and stuff? You were sad. I just wanted one. Mm. I didn't know it was such a big deal. That's funny. I always change my Jesus hair. Jesus Christ, dude! <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what you're looking at. That's you. <laughs> yeah. That's it makes me look honestly, fat too but you look homeless <laughs> oh it's like the forest gump <laughs> dude is that it has nothing to do with that though like like a forest gump thing no i just want i mean i guess like i was having all those kind of vibes go through me but dude, no not on purpose you definitely look better now yeah i would say yeah i there was a time where there was a time where my id looked like this and my face looked like that so oh. And that was problematic, like getting back into the U.S. and things like I would get, they'd be like, bro, this is not you. <laughs> but now actually my ID is that. <laughs> and I have this. And that's no problem. If you if you go from like looking disheveled to more handsome or polished, no problem. They'll let you right through security. But if you do the flip, man, I'll be in like some weird diner you know, in some tiny small town. Yeah. And they'll be like, did anyone ever tell you you look like Mike Posner? I'm like, yeah, I am Mike Posner. And you're like, nah. <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I use the, I don't mind that one. If they, anyone ever say you look like Daniel? I'm like, oh yeah, I've been hearing that a lot lately. I think it's the hair. Yeah. That's why I always say that. But I never say it to me. Sometimes I would try to be like, yeah, I'm his brother. <laughs> and I'm like, I gotta tell you, he's a douchebag. Yeah, yeah. You talked about like songs that you didn't know would become hits. Uh I took a pill in Ibiza. I mm. feel like that's the story of it. What happened? Because it initially started almost as like an acoustic ballad. And now it's the song that gets played in clubs, like on the radio. Like Yeah, these this, these guys um, named Sieb, they did a remix of it from Norway. And um, it just started to like catch on. I don't know how. Um, I was watching it. I was like living in my van at the time and it went to number one in Norway. On the you, you didn't send it to him. Number one Norway, 35 <laughs> Norwegian number ones. <laughs> no, the, our, my label sent it to him. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. they paid him to do it. Yeah, that's like a normal thing. Um, part of a release plan, I'll get some remixes done. So they, my how, how much do you pay for that, by the way? You know, I didn't do it. My label did it. Yeah, yeah my record label went out to them and... Um, Got the remix done. And like I re remix other people's songs. So I'm yeah. all about the remix. They did the remix. It just started to blow up. And I don't know why or how, but it did. And um, it was beautiful, man. Mike, there's another moment that came to mind. You said this quote about um, your job as an artist is to put butterflies in a pretty jar. Mm. What do you mean by that? You, you're so god damn well researched bro you're putting these quotes yeah, out from yeah. <laughs> think i think what i meant by that was <laughs> he's like rick ross now he's like <laughs> yeah he's like, the pauses <laughs> <sighs> no i think what i meant by that was um when you get an idea 
uh, inspiration. I'm talking about inspiration. Yeah. You got an idea for a song. It's like a butterfly. And then when you're putting in a pretty jar, although maybe I would use a different metaphor now. It seems kind of mean to the butterfly. But um, the idea when it comes is not formed. It's like a melody or something, but the song isn't done. Mm-hmm. So then the rest of my job is creating the artifice around that seed of creativity, seed of inspiration, and that's the jar. So you have the you have the butterfly, it's beautiful, which you didn't make, God made it. And then the jar you want to like put, you want to put a nice frame around the painting that God just kind of gave you, mm-hmm. you know. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was deep. Hey, bro. Touch it, man. <laughs> Hey, I like, bro. I like this guy. Hey, dude. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> you ever think about you, like, as a person, like, he has a different thought of you or he has a different thought. Like, every your mom has a different, mm-hmm. like, your mom has a different, like, perspective of you than your dad yeah. does or your brother or yeah. whoever, right? Like, so I always think about that, too. Like, like he has a different thought of me than you do, than he does. It's, like, cra- kind of weird. Well, I have a Sounds like I'm high, you know? But I have a different thought of you than I did before I met you. Huh. It's, like, way different. What, what changed? Well, he, like, I didn't understand. You see him just like doing crazy shit, but you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, like you got a <laughs> team here. Else. He like starts talking shit. You see him doing crazy shit, but he's a lot dumber in person. No, than he looks. no he's not. He's not. He like you're like you're smart for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you're smart for sure. Thanks, man. So uh, there's a lot. Like I guess I I think it's probably true of all people, but I'm guilty of it now. Like I didn't think about everything that went into goes into what you do yeah i think it's a I lot that with everybody too i even try i catch myself too i try to never like be too negative because i know anyone's successful to, there's more work than it probably seems for any genre of any category in yeah life. so yeah that's interesting man it's really interesting stuff we're going hiking <laughs> you coming stefan when do you do that what, what month if i do it uh i haven't committed to it yet yeah but if i do it It'd probably be July. Damn, I'm busy then. Fuck. Yeah. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I want to come. That'd be sick. 